everybody. I hope your post Paddy's Day hangover is treating you well. I can tell you that we are recording this pre Paddy's Day because we are smart um, and also old. So we do need to, you know, plan our hangovers. And yeah, so that's why coming to you from a very sober random Thursday in the week is the Beer Ladies podcast. I'm your host, Tandy. And today with me, we've got Katie, we've got Lisa, and we've got Christina. Hey! Now, today we have got a slight themed Paddy's Day, Guinness at least, themed episode. It's not a super strong link, but what we want to talk about is the industrialization of beer and how we came from hyper-local, really small breweries only in tiny areas serving local communities to the really big names that we know of, including Guinness and Heineken and Carlsberg and all of the big recognizable names. We're probably going to focus mostly on Europe, just so that you all know, um, because the timelines are slightly different in Europe versus the United States, and we're not really going to touch on Asia or Africa. But, you know, we imagine that there are similar pathways, just maybe not the same time periods. So, um, we're going to go around, around the houses, see what everyone is drinking, and then we're going to launch into what on earth was the Industrial Revolution anyway, and how did it affect beer? Cool. Um, Christina Friend, I know I know you're not drinking today, so maybe just let us know if you've got any beverage in front of you, regardless. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. nothing. I, have, I have my notes in front of me. That is all that I have on this Thursday. I am tired, friends. So, it's yeah, been no, a time. I've got nothing. It has. It's been a week. So, no, I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it is a thing. All good. Okay, Lisa, what have you got, friend? So, I, I had very, really good intentions to go out and get something interesting from the open gate or something else in the Guinness portfolio. And then I was led astray by just some of my, my local faves. So, I have a, a Hope Hop On, which matches the gorgeous weather we've had today. I wanted something that felt light and summery insofar as we have that so but it's, it also counts because Dublin Brewery so all uh, all good so thank you hope hope hop on is perfect for a school night very good Katie what you drinking well I feel like Christina has done twice the preparation so that I have done no <laughs> preparation so that is really good so therefore I I am I'm, I'm kind of off season I'm drinking a Lunasa double IPA from St. Mm -hmm. Mel's in uh in Longford and uh, Lunasa, for people who don't know, this is the, my tenuous link to St. Patrick's Day, is uh, the Irish for August, the month oh. of August. There you go. So Lunasa was kind of like a, let's start the Harvest Festival. Not the end of the Harvest Festival, the start of the Harvest Festival. The beginning of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely. Oh, yeah. There, from a lovely, lovely uh, Irish craft brewer. That's brilliant. Go. Cool. And myself, I also, Lisa, I was also led astray. I was going to drink a Guinness, but I was even going to wear a Guinness <laughs> t-shirt, but I just didn't. Uh, but I've got, I've got a Dublin brewery. I've got Rascals and we've got Happy Days. Oh, oh shit. Lovely. Happy Days. The, you know, the camera's always playing tricks. It's a juicy session pale ale. It's a 4.1% and I have matching glassware for once in my life. Oh, fancy. Yep, for those on the video. And if you're not watching us on video, please head over to YouTube. You can actually see our faces and look at the t-shirts that we wear sometimes and look at, you know, Lisa wears hats, you know, and that's kind of cool. It happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, last St. Patrick's Day, I did wear a green wig, so. Yes. Yeah. 100% true. So I feel I've like done I've done my bit. I've done my bit. I don't need it this year. Love it. So if you haven't already subscribed to us on YouTube, go on and do that. And as for the rest of the social channels, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Look for us at Beer Ladies Pod or Beer Ladies Podcast. Those are our handles. And you can even buy us a beer on buy me a coffee forward slash Beer Ladies Podcast. <laughs> and that would be mighty appreciated. Okay, let's get into big, big beer. Lisa, do you want to kick us off? Like, you know, what are we talking about here? What's the, what's the impact or the significance of the Industrial Revolution on beer? Uh -oh. Yeah, so it's a small one to start off, but uh, it's, it's you know, I, I think if we think about it when it relates to beer, it's less about, uh, well, I would say it's less about the sort of, yay, factories, now we have lots of children working in factories and, you know, all of these kind of terrible things and more about this shift from 
this locally produced thing that's available maybe regionally to something that is mass produced is shipped you know, I wouldn't say worldwide at first that comes a little bit later but we are really talking about you know sort of you know, machine driven or steam powered if you like um, manufacturing so we are moving away from this sort of made at home or made in the local community to things that are made you know on a on a big scale but I think when we're talking about beer it's not just about kind of the mechanization or um, the other things that led to that it's much more about kind of some of the scientific things that happened there, sort of different discoveries, and we'll chat a little bit about that. But there are so many things that are happening that start off on a small scale that they kind of ripple. And I think that's what's really, really interesting is, is some of it is almost sort of purely scientific. And then some of it is really how much can we churn out and how much can we distribute? But that, I think that part comes a little bit later. So, you know, very broadly speaking, we're not just talking big factories, we're still talking small and it's sort of that almost incremental shift from you know, something we make at home, a cottage industry, to something that is mass produced and is available all over the place. And we, we really first see this in kind of, you know, late 18th, early 19th century, where we also start to get the rise of branding and all of this stuff. We're not going to get into all of it because that in itself would be a huge thing just to talk branding. But uh, yeah, we go from making it at home to making it for everyone. And, and I will say that while this is happening, people are aware that this isn't necessarily a good thing. So, um, what I'm sharing with you all today is a bit of a sneak peek from one of my chapters in my books, uh, or one my book, books, <laughs> book, one book um, about uh, brewing in Ireland. So it's it's in my chapter on, well, obviously the 19th century. So part of it is are bits and pieces of some of my research without giving, the, of course, the entire book away. Um, but with that, I'm going to share different parts of my research. And the one thing I do want to share with you first, because I think this is really, really important to, to, to note, is that people understand that the increasing industrialization is not necessarily a good thing for rural communities, for poor people, for working class people. So, for example, we have a letter from a gentleman uh, from County Cork, and he writes to Henry Goulburn, the chief secretary of Ireland uh, at the House of Parliament, and he talks about brewing in Ireland. Um, and in this, he discussed at length the issues faced by farmers and workers in the country. And in particular, he talked about, quote, the monopoly of brewing and distilling by a great capitalist, end quote. And he talked about how the concentration of breweries in the hands of the, like, in the hands of just a few people had really bad negative impacts um, for farmers and small breweries. And he talks about the loss of the the bond, as he calls it, between farmers and these small scale breweries in the rise of these massive industrial brewing um, apparatuses. And so people are very cognizant of the fact that this is harming these relationships between working people, working class people um, at the time. And then as it continues, we'll see that. But there, there are definitely like positives to this as well. It's not just a negative thing, but there's people are aware as we are now of what happens when we concentrate businesses into the hands of a few and we take away workers' rights and workers, you know, ownership of their work. So th th that's my soapbox. I just want to put that <laughs> out there first. Uh, yeah. Well, before so, the, the Industrial Revolution, around about how many breweries would have been in Ireland? Do we, hundreds. Do we, hundreds. Hundreds. Wow. Hundreds. And it, well, I mean, well, it wasn't just the Industrial Revolution. The famine took out a lot of them as well. OK. Um, but the Industrial Revolution took out a lot uh, big breweries took out more when they could use the train to get into rural communities and that kind of stuff but that is an episode in and of itself um we can talk about that another time but yeah so we went from a hundreds of breweries and there's there is research into exactly how many have come and gone there's some really good papers actually but yeah it drops a lot because there's lots of breweries and just rural, small cottage industries, as Lisa mm. said, in rural communities, and they drop fast um, over mm. the course of the 19th century. And is the culprit in Ireland just Guinness, or were there other really big breweries that took over the country, I guess, in, in a way that maybe Guinness also did, but in the early days? Yes. So we're... Um, I'm going to go through some of the big breweries in Ireland. There was a book awesome. that came out in 1889 by Alfred Bernard. 
Uh, he toured, well, four books, actually. He toured so many breweries in the UK and Ireland, and he wrote up about them. So uh, for part of, part of my book work, I've gone through all four volumes. I've wrote down notes for every single Irish brewery. I've synthesized them and compared them all. And I'm going to give you some highlights for that there, but I'm not going to give, of course, the whole thing away. I'm going to have to read the book. Um, <laughs> buy the book. And we, we did mention him on our Reinhardt episode for those who listened the other week. So do, mm-hmm. uh, do listen back. But that was only in passing. That was more about kind of his role in sort of industrial espionage and, and all that good stuff. But it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I know, Christina, you've got, you've got dived much more deeply into it than, uh, than I have. So, so looking forward to this. Oh yeah. Well, well, first of all, I want to start with not Alfred because yeah. he doesn't talk about all of the breweries. So another good source, um, Samuel Lewis wrote a topography of Ireland in 1837. And he talks about in sort of in passing sort of industries that he came across in different places in Ireland. And actually, I think it's really interesting because he notes the size of the brewery, if it's, well, like if it's big or if it's small, and then tells us how many people are in the town. I think which kind of gives you an idea of what kind of towns can uphold certain sizes of breweries or if, Mm. if you have to have a big town to have a big brewery. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what Thomas or Samuel found. Thomas where did I come up with that Samuel found so for example Newtown Ardies in County Down I'm probably butchered that Newton name. I'm going to correct you on that it's Newton Ards okay someone See? cut this out please <laughs> <laughs> cut this out let me try this again say it, okay. say it again Newton Ards Newton Ards in County Down yeah at the time of his writing had 11,000 inhabitants and they had a brewery, which uh, apparently was founded in 1769, failed. And then in 1819, it was purchased by John Johnson Esquire, who restored the brewery on an extensive scale. And they were producing 7,000 barrels of beer per year. And they also possessed maltings on site. And this is something oh, that wow. we're going to talk about throughout is most of the big breweries also had maltings on site. In mm. fact, mm. like all of the big ones I'm going to talk about had their own maltings on site or close to their site. So, but that doesn't mean that they didn't also purchase malt from other places. They did. Right. Some mm. of them did. Some of them didn't. But most of them also had their own maltings. Uh, Donna Moore in County Tyrone also had a massive brewery that produced up to 10,500 barrels of ale and beer a year. And apparently they had a very famous ale. Limerick, we are told, had seven breweries, which made porter ale Damn. and beer totally totaling uh, 5,000 barrels a year, um, the majority of which was consumed in Limerick. Waterford City had several public breweries who made beer so good that they, quote, superseded the necessity of any importation from England. Oh, well done. And in fact, they were exporting their beer. Wow. Oh. Wow. Yeah. What so, is a public brewery? As so, opposed that's to- like a, so that's like, you know, you're brewing for, for other people as opposed to brewing for your like own household or, you know, you can, you're selling it out to retailers who can then sell it or you're selling it for general consumption as opposed to, I'm making this for my house. Um, Drahada had three big breweries making beer and ale. Um, one of them on James's Street had its own maltings on site um, and apparently made a really famous ale that was shipped off to England and other places. Uh, New Ross also had three extensive breweries. And then he goes, I'm not going to go through all of them, but a lot, a lot of breweries. I will say that Oma in County Tyrone only had 2,211 people and they also had a famous brewery. So you didn't have to be, <laughs> you know, these massive towns. So there was although, no, no perfect ratio. <laughs> but I, I mean, 2,211 people is not super small either. I mean, mm. but yeah, they, you know, were, uh, there's not necessarily a proportion there. Like breweries are, they're everywhere. Everyone, yeah. you get a everyone has a brewery. Um, so yeah, so that kind of gives you a bit of a background, perhaps, of some of these slightly smaller breweries. But now I'm gonna move into some of the really big ones. Um, and so here we're back. We're off, we're back with Alfred. 
on his uh, on his brewery tours. And it's really fascinating because honestly, you kind of feel like you're reading a beer blog from now. Of some, <laughs> That's amazing. You know, some 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 person going through the brewery with their, you know, their little their glass of beer talking about the size of the fermenting tanks because <laughs> a middle aged white man had opinions about beer. Basically, <laughs> <Go figure>. was, <laughs> yes, honestly, if he was alive now, he probably would have a podcast. Um, fair play to him fair play to him <laughs> so good lad <laughs> and he's actually really funny and he tries yeah. to include some history around the brewery now his history is not always accurate but he's mm. trying yeah. he's trying and he's always very hopeful and sort of positive about everything i i do enjoy his books so in total, he had some 10 Irish breweries and then there was a Maltings, but we're not going to talk about the Maltings today, I don't think. So I'm going to name them. So Phoenix Porter Brewery on James's Street, Dublin, and you might recognize that because that's also home to Guinness. Um, Ladies Well Brewery, also known as Jay Murphy & Co. Limited in Cork. Mm -hmm. Amish and Crawford, aka Cork Porter Brewery in Cork. Shocking. Uh, our D Street Brewery, uh, Brewery also known, well, proprietors are Watkins and Co. So sometimes they're also known as that. Anchor Brewery on Usher Street in Dublin. Um, that's the proprietors are uh, Peter de Arce when he was touring. So you, sometimes there's, when you're looking at industrial brewing papers or articles by scholars or beer historians, they'll flip back and forth between calling it, for example, our Anchor Brewery or Darcy they'll kind of go back okay. and forth so do be mindful of that when you're kind of researching that's why I'm saying both because mm. sometimes they're known of, you might be more familiar with Darcy or Watkins and Co than you are with RD Street or Anchor so where am I Mount Joy and that's Spinletter and Co Limited uh, North Ann Street Brewery in Dublin as well which is the providers are Jameson Him and Co uh, and then, of course, St. James Estate Brewery, uh, Arthur Guinness and Son Limited. Southgate Brewery Limited, proprietors are Lane & Co. Limited in Cork. And finally, J.R. Knott & Co. Limited in Cork. So lots of Cork breweries, lots of Dublin breweries. And like I said, you really do feel like you're reading a beer blogger's latest post, honestly. <laughs> um, with some random poetry thrown in, because you really did like his How accessible, like his Christina, is his stuff, like for someone who's not a historian and is the language readable and oh yeah like when I'm saying it's like like a post I mean it's literally like a blog post like he's like so I was here and it was a nice day and we were riding <laughs> along on the way to the brewery and I noticed this person standing here and then we were into the brewery and this was our tour guide and so then we were walking along and I saw this big fermenter and so it's really like that it's very easy reading um I would say you should know a little bit about brewing because he really likes to talk about the size and shape of the coppers fermenters hot backs everything shocked, shocked. he's a Which man we gonna, <laughs> you know we're, we are we are going to talk a bit about those because some of them are particularly interesting but yeah. yeah like he goes in very very intricate detail about um what he's seeing and and we're going to choose to trust him today at least on the those specifications because he really just doesn't have any reason to lie yeah. um and probably a lot of reasons not to lie because the brewery could probably be like uh no that is not what happened sir <laughs> do, we, so, do we know in his time like who would have been reading those books or who would have been enjoying if, you know his for lack of a better word blog posts i know it was in books rather than blogs but who would have been the audience? Possibly other breweries, people that were into beer and brewing. Um, there's an entire like Brewers Gazette, Brewing Journals. People read them all over just to get a better idea. His books were pretty pop. I mean, he had four volumes. Yeah, that's always the... been my understanding is that it was fellow, it was brewers, you know, who were just like, oh, what's going on in this country or that country? We're like, oh, someone's done the work for me. So, yeah. And and he, his was popular enough that he actually got some feedback that they wanted him to go to smaller breweries. So then he put out another volume to just go to smaller breweries. So people are definitely reading what he's writing. That's awesome. Uh, it is pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that was a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A beer journalist of the, of the day, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a bit, it's, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. 
I think it's, mm. I think it's pretty cool. So there's a lot, lot of things to talk about here. Um, I guess I'm going to start with one of my favorite stories because it's already street brewery. And the reason I'm going to talk about that is because their brewery is built on a medieval brewery, possibly. Ooh. So the Abbey of St. Thomas had a brewery on their campus as monastic communities are wanting to do. And they also, they're, they're tied up in a lot of like brewing history in, in, in Dublin. And apparently the Artie Street Brewery was built there. And uh, yeah, and so Bernard talks about this and he, um, he says, and one of my favorite quotes from him, and I'm going to just read this to you. He says, quote, all this should certainly give the present firm a prescriptive right to brew. But in this practical age, they wisely do not rely on any intangible title. For what we saw during our tour of the brewery, they appear to have called in all the aid which the most modern appliances can afford to produce an article, the quality of which commands itself to the public taste. So... I think that's just wonderful because, well, I mean, Bernard talks in depth about sort of this history, but, you know, they don't rely on it, though. Don't worry. They're still making really good beer. They don't uh, they don't bank on on that, which I think is kind of cool. So I guess sort of probably one of the first questions to ask are what are these breweries making? Yeah, maybe. And how how are they making it? So I'll talk Hmm. a little bit about my findings here and of course porter and stout right so that is the name of the game but it's not the only it's not the only ones it's not the only ones but porter and stout are particularly popular and that's something that irish breweries are famous for they're exporting it and that is pretty much across the board most of them are making a porter or stout both all of the above um and they are shipping these out all over the world but they are making other things they are definitely is- making other things is the reason that they were mostly making porter and stout due to popularity or was it because they wanted to be like Guinness or is there something totally different that I'm missing? It's not because they wanted to be like Guinness. So Guinness was not, Guinness did not have a corner on that market as, as you would say. It was mm. because it was popular. It was incredibly popular. Um, it was popular exported. It was popular locally. It was just a very popular style. And they mm. were making other things. Um, so pale ales, for example, was something else that they were making. I think Cork Porter Brewery also made a pale ale um, because, oh, yes, they made a pale ale. They made a pale ale um, because their well water was said to have similar characteristics to the famous water of Burton. Um, oh, all of my beer nerds out there. So they did actually make a, a pale ale there. And there are other breweries. They made other. They made other different things. But porter stout. These were really famous styles of the day. I mean, they're still famous now. There's a reason for that, right? They're they're good. Yeah, and I think you can't undersell how important those were to that. What was then the British Empire because they were exporting those everywhere. In as much as people like to talk about IPA, and I know we've talked about this on a previous episode, but porter is what's really getting exported everywhere. And so you know, I think you have to. If it's going to England, it may then be going other places as well so yeah and that is one thing that I I will mention briefly is that beer as always had a very prominent place in the war machine and colonialism Mm -hmm. so beer is being shipped out to colonies British colonies all over the world to support their colonial regimes to um to soldiers to keep those things going for worse you know it's When we talk about beer, there are good things about beer and there are bad things about beer. And beer definitely had a pretty strong role in colonialism and Irish beer as well. So we are talking about Irish beer being shipped out to those places. So Mm -hmm. do keep that in mind. And I would say, like, you walk into an Irish pub today and if it's not got craft taps, it's got got a stout and it's got lots of lagers. Were lagers common? in the 1800s so that longer longer is a oh that's an episode that's a, <laughs> it is an episode itself. yeah um, yeah, yeah. That's well, and all that stuff yeah. exactly I'll, I'll dive in very quickly with a little bit here around what's happening elsewhere in europe because 
you know, obviously there's a lot going on in Germany. And, and again, our, our, our friend, you know, Mr. Bird, it's going around and he's, he's going to Germany, he's going other places. But if we then go up to Denmark, uh, where I'm going in a couple of weeks, by the time this drops, I'll be going in about a week, so yay. Um, but, you know, Carlsberg is really leading the way in terms of the industrialization there and lager, you know, it's, it, we're not thinking about that, you know, the Carlsberg lager we have today necessarily, but I mean, this is where we're finding out that yeast is a real thing that exists and isolating it and being able to reproduce it consistently, really working on pasteurization. I mean, other mm -hmm. things that are essentially discovered at the Carlsberg labs are like how the pH scale works, like things that are fundamental to not just brewing, but like water chemistry in general. You know, all of this is really coming out of Carlsberg. And a lot of it is because they're sort of fiddling around saying, well, what are they doing in Germany? How can we figure out how to do some of this lagering stuff in a more mm. consistent way? Because, you know, as we know, if we're talking about pre-industrial beers, there's no, not a lot of consistency. You're just kind of hoping that, you know, your temperature was good and, you know, all, all of that other stuff. And I know we've, we've talked about it before and it's kind of its own episode, but you can't sort of not talk about the role of Carlsberg when it comes to really codifying and you know, figuring out a lot of the science behind this and then working on refrigeration and how that works. And that's really what's getting lager all over Europe. And a little bit is happening in the States too, in terms of, um, when, you know, uh, with Adolphus Bush. But again, it's a little bit later there. So it's a little earlier in, in Europe, but it's really, um, you know, if it weren't for these sort of scientific advances, it's much more about that. And I think we won't talk too much about it because it is its own episode, but I think it's interesting that that Carlsberg, uh, as a group, wanted to make these things sort of uh, open access, if you like. They wanted this to be information for the world to, to learn and, and take, and that's still sort of part of the, uh, the the science they still do now at the Carlsberg Foundation. Um, whereas everyone else was like, this is proprietary, I got my thing. And uh, <laughs> so it's just a very different uh, business ethos. They still wanted to make money, but they also wanted to kind of help mankind. So it's just a, an interesting and, and different lens. That's, but that's cool. Mm -hmm big with your lager over there yeah yeah so they're trying to reverse engineer the reinheit in a, in in a way to make it a little it bit a very, little bit very... yeah yeah i mean we could have a whole episode on on emil christian hansen who's you know really the scientist there who kicks all of this off and figures out yeast and all of that good stuff but it's because you know he knows about louis pasteur he sees what's going on there and is you know it's all like oh we could make this good we could make this consistent and and lo they they do so i was just going to tangent off there seeing as it's you know patty's this is airing the day after patty's day and there's a guinness connection a little bit after our time frame um we'll say 1899 was the guy the time that this guy william seeley gossett joined the guinness brewery and in the same way that Carlsberg are innovating inside of the science thing yeah he's a he's a mathematician kind of brewer and he comes up if anybody has done stats in college <laughs> or anywhere you will know what the student's t-test is the student's t-test was developed by this guy William Seely Gossett in Guinness so that he could test like different malls and different hops and he could use small little batches small sample sizes and decide is this matched is this is this different or is this not so I just thought I'd throw that in there tangent yeah. go back to Tandy now what were you going to say I love it no, because, you, you know, what I've been reading, I've been busy reading Pete Brown's book, um, Man Walks Into a Pub, and it's supposed to be a very, like, light, <laughs> there we go, Lisa's showing it, it's a very, like, light intro into the history of beer, um, but what was really interesting was that he touches on a number of sort of scientific discoveries or uh, advances that really speed up the industrialization of everything, but specifically beer. So things like the hydrometer, things like a coffee roaster, um, you know, roasting malt was probably something very different before there was the technology to roast it without fiery, smoky smells. Absolutely. So, yeah, so, so thinking things like pH, understanding how yeast works and understanding pasteurization, you know, these are all really big technological milestones in the history of beer. And what I understand happened is that the guys who had money or the guys who could get investment were able to capitalize on that. And the guys who didn't really have that capital often fell behind um, because people were demanding beer in different countries or different counties or different regions. And the fact that people were moving around the globe a lot more at the time really did also help, I guess, um, the industrialization of all industries and especially beer. And to yeah. your point, Katie, consistency was something that was becoming more and more important. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a big bit there, Tandy, that you touched on is that these, a lot of these, as they're starting to get bigger and bigger, are controlling their own distribution. And that mm. is huge because they're having, they're investing in things like refrigerated, you know, train cars, things like that. Again, that's, that's really invented for, you know, for beer, you know, both, I mean, Carlsberg does it, uh, Anheuser-Busch does it, although it's not Anheuser and Bush yet at that point. But, you know, these are huge things in terms of just like, you know, the idea of a cold chain, that's, that's all from, from beer, but Again, the ones who kind of got there first, to your point, are you know the ones who are able to capitalize on it and getting that you know that branding out there. Again, much bigger conversation there on that piece. But and I, I think probably a good then segue back to Christina to say how did that affect some of these small to medium ones when you have people starting to say, "Ooh, we're going to own the distribution channels." I mean, I think that's it's such a shift. Yeah, I mean, hmm. yeah, like I can I can talk a bit about um, specific inventions that happened in Ireland or Irish inventions. And I can talk about specific equipment that's mentioned over and over and yeah. over again in some of these breweries. So first, I guess I'll talk about Plunkett Brothers. This is the malting company. And I wasn't sure I was oh, going to share with them today, but we are going to talk about them today. Um, based on what you guys have just said, I just want to kind of go off that. So we're told that Plunkett um the the founder of Plunkett Brothers and speaking of ties between um colonialism and and the like there there is also a tie between Catholic breweries and Protestant breweries and people boycotting Protestant breweries um as a, as a way to you know support Irish freedom and even Daniel O'Connell was one of the founders of a, of a brewery in Dublin. So there, there are actually quite a few links between breweries and, and Catholic emancipation and, and those sorts of things. But that is a thing for another day. <laughs> but also, Daniel <laughs> O'Connell was a Protestant. Yeah. And a Kerry man. Just, just throw it in there. But he <laughs> was very sympathetic to the cause of the, yes. of the Irish Catholic. Oh, yeah. And, and and there's quite a few breweries that that say that they're not going to hire people who are engaging in in activities that are damaging to Catholic populations and stuff that are definitely owned by Protestants. So it's it's not a it's an us versus people who are being jerks kind of a situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that is a gross understatement. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely people from all faiths on 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 that side. But yes, so we're going to talk about the Plunkets. So the the founder of Plunkett Brothers, he was really into chemistry and his friend, Mr. Busby, this is all what Bernard is telling us. So we're we're going to trust Bernard on this one, um, who owned a brewery in Black Pit. It was called the City of Dublin Brewing Company. And he asked him for help because for porter brewers, they wanted to get this dark color, but they were adding burnt sugar and um Busby said this gave it an unpleasant taste, and then they thought it was possibly unhealthy. So he asked Plunkett to help him out. So he did all these experiments with vegetables and all these things, and they finally came up with a plan for roasting malt that was incredibly successful and very popular. So he built this massive business, this huge business, which eventually fell into the hands of his son's widow, Eliza Plunkett. Um, and she ran, she, very, she ran it very well. Unfortunately, they posted up another um, brewing house in London and they actually had to shut that down because um, they had a lousy manager who basically screwed them over, oh. um, which is just a shame. But yes, so they're they're really famous for for their their malt but that wasn't all the malt they were making we we know that there are all these different kinds of malt to be had and I am just pulling up my notes on that so there are let me say Plunkett's maltings and experiments so they have black candied amber and hydride as well as a kind that was new to Bernard called gold brown malt um, which we are told is a specialty of the Plunkett brothers. Um, and this gold brown malt was used to make ales and stouts and it apparently added richness. Sounds um, delicious. I want to brew with that malt. <laughs> candied malt was another special one made by the Plunkett brothers. Um, and it was used for, it was used with pale malts to make quote, public house mild ales. Oh, okay. Um, Let's do it. Yeah. And mm. we're told that this was most nutritious and could be only created with the finest of barley and gives ales, quote, a delicious aromatic smack. Hey, uh, I'm with I'm here them. For it. 
Yeah. yeah. Also crystal malt, amber brown malt, um, which was created using oak chips. So that's Yum. an idea. There are all these different kinds of malt. And it's not just Plunkett that's making this. A lot of these breweries that have their own maltings are also roasting malt in their own places. So they have their own mills. They have their, you know, they're grinding their own stuff and they are roasting it themselves. So to give you an idea, um, how much they could grind, for example, Anchor Brewery had five sets of mill rollers that could grind 135 barrels of malt per hour. Oh, wow. In contrast, our D Street Brewery could crush grain at 60 barrels per hour. Um, and again, at Guinness Brewery, the number two brewery or the new brewery, because they had two breweries on campus at the time. So number one and number two, number two being the new brewery. They had six steel rollers that could grind 800 bushels per hour. So, wow. yeah. So we're, there, there are some clear contrasts there. And then of course, after the grinding and whatever, it's sent off to the mash tons. And here's where things get a little bit more exciting. So we're, you know, you know, it's not, uh, it's not the same um, as before when we are working with sort of these small breweries may, or, you know, you're making it over your kitchen. Um, these, these are huge. We're talking engines now with horsepower, uh, steam engines and the like. Some of these, huge but the one some of these breweries actually even had electricity that they use for their lighting so this is quite a different contrast to what we saw before they have these engines that do everything from stirring the mash to cleaning the casks in like all of these big breweries and I just think that's very exciting and I'm gonna just say my dad was born in 1944 and he remembers growing up without electricity so electricity was not very widespread in Ireland at this time yeah. maybe in the cities or something but yeah it wasn't in every home it wasn't uh normal everywhere mm. rural electrification especially no yeah. sure and some of these, we'll, we'll talk about mash tons and I'll get into like different equipment, but some of these mash tons, for example, are, are huge. So at Anchor Street Brewery, the number four mash ton was what we're told is 25 feet in diam diameter and seven foot deep. And Bernard tells us that it was to be the largest of any brewery in Ireland. So oh, wow. huge mash tons. And a lot of these mash tons have what was called steel's mashing machine um, and a sparging apparatus with internal mashing gear. And this was all driven by steam. So really, you know, some very advanced sort of technological equipment. And this is some the, the steel's mashing machine is something that you just see across the board in a lot of these breweries. This is all mechanical and they're all using that then these sounds different. humongous to me yeah. like that's if you mm. found an old mash tun there you could easily turn that into a massive swimming pool right <laughs> yeah i mean this could this this had the capacity for 300 barrels this particular oh, yeah one. and these are the kind of things these get talked about in in all those technical journals you're talking about before they're all talking about like oh look at the latest technology who's using it and it's you know you get very you know, these very sort of deep technical papers in a lot of those, you know, 19th century brewers journals are exactly about that. And it, it's a great way, sometimes it has a snapshot of a particular brewery or, or what they were doing. But uh, sometimes too, I think it's what they, they wanted you to think they were doing. So you have to be mm. a little uh, cautious about interpreting some of it. Yeah, and, and these, these machines can be made out of oak or metal, all different kinds of things. But yeah, they, they do like to kind of have say things a certain way to make sure yeah. that they're presenting themselves in a in a certain thing um marketing will market like yeah mm -hmm. yeah um and then of course you know if we're moving along the brewing process we're going to go to the coppers now for the boil um and we're going to talk about anchor brewery which apparently had one that he called a mammoth copper of proportions never dreamed of. Um, <laughs> we, we've all been there, right? I mean. <laughs> that was said to be the largest in the world that held 1,300 barrels. 
Um, he says he's not sure if it's the largest, actually, but it's the biggest one he's ever seen. And I'm going to give you a quote to just give you this kind of visualization that he's painting for us. Quote, it is not an exaggeration to say that a couple of Irish cabins or one storied cottage could be contained therein. As a matter of fact, when it was erected, over 30 persons partook of refreshments therein. My well, goodness. In I'd say that actual was kettle. Hmm. You'll see photographs of this in the 19th century and even early 20th century. People having, you know, they'll have, they'll be raising their glasses inside. They'll have, you know, dinners and it, it is a thing. Like it's a, a thing you see throughout that period. I would say like, like 1880s to 1920s. And it's fascinating. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And they all have big ones. Phoenix Brewery had five coppers, which each of them were told is massive. Hold One held 500 barrels. Cork Porter Brewery had four coppers all together, which could hold up to 1,560 barrels, and each vessel cost 2,000 pounds. So, you know. But guys, can you imagine, like, having way too many beers because you're at a brewery, climbing up a ladder, climbing <laughs> down a ladder, oh, yeah. to have more beers, oh my god, and maybe a bit of nibbles. But by, the, by, by that stage, you're, like, tanked, and you're actually in a fucking tank. What the hell? <laughs> Tanked they, tank. <laughs> I reckon they would have sold this as an experience, you know? Oh, yeah. Don't yeah, take it. It's right. like, come and drink beer in the tank where we brew beer, you know? Mm. Yeah. Just bring a straw. Just bring a straw and a lilo and just have yeah. a little. We're saying Bridget with her lake of beer, but like in yeah. the, you know, absolutely in the, in the in the storage tank, actually in the storage bag. Yeah, if they kept those build those buildings, because what what's left of Mountjoy Brewery is is right by my house, but there's only a couple of buildings left. But you think, oh, if they'd kept that, that could have been just tourist complex. I mean, like you say, yeah, hotel, spa, or, or, you know, plenty of scope. For a little that. bit of a, a lazy river of beer, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> get into a tube, just go, yeah. Uh, yeah, but seriously, would you drink from the Lazy River of Beer? Never. No, no. I would no. never drink from it, but I would float <laughs> Absolutely in it. Absolutely not. I would totally float in it, though. But where, where is it that you can you can have, uh, like, a bath and beer, right? Where's that? Brew dog. Yeah. Why is, this one? is there one in, is it's it Prague continent. somewhere, I want to say? <laughs> Oh, there might be one on There's the continent like a famous as well. place where it's like, I think, I think they did it way before BrewDog did it, actually. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I've been to the what was the former Santa Claus Brewery in Switzerland. And now that is a big spa hotel. And you do swim in what look like big copper. They're not really. They've just sort of taken the look and feel. There are bits and pieces of the old, the old brewery there, but it's more for show than... Uh, they're not really reusing most of the, the kit, as, as it were. But it, it's a lovely experience, though. Recommend. So... Yeah, and and that that is a problem with a lot of the breweries in Ireland. They're in Dublin. They're just gone. There's nothing. They're just gone. The, yeah, it's just completely. There's nothing remains. Like or like one building. Yeah, and it'll be an outbuilding. It won't be something that was part of the yeah. kind of main, uh, you know, industrial, you know, complex. If you like, it'll be like, oh, here's where the storage shed was, or you know, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's you know, mostly it's just gone. Because K Katie mentioned it earlier, but um, when I when I moved here, I expected that it would be similar to the UK in that every town, every village would have its own brewery and there'd be Carscale and there'd be all these like heritage focused breweries, I guess. But I just didn't see it. I saw lots of commercial beers um, and it was like Guinness and then Heineken, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Heineken, Carlsberg, I uh, can't remember the rest, but like literally green labels and Guinness. That was it. And maybe you'd find a Murphy's or you know maybe you'd find like a craft beer obviously the craft scene has exploded a bit but it's it's interesting to me because the history is so I, not forgotten but it was so lost through the process that even even the culture and the dna of of the villages and the towns didn't really retain you know in terms yeah. of lots of breweries yeah to just return to the opening quote that this is what happens when you have just the brewing in the hands of a few capitalists basically or one capitalist in particular. Yeah. Um, this is what happens. They erase it and they purposely erase it. They went around and bought up all the merch from all these places. And, you know, there was a deliberate trying, you know, Atio and Memore, like trying to. Yeah. You know, and this is like, people think of this as a, you know, sort of post 1945 thing. That's a very American take on it. This has been happening for, you know, since the 1880s, at least, you know, of, you know, sort of buying them up and just having them in the fold or just destroying them completely you know it's you know some of those brands do still exist absolutely but others they might exist but it's it's certainly not the same um and now, now that said i think 
that there, you know, you, you can certainly, you know, tip your hat to, to Diageo and the, the archives that they maintain for Guinness and, and all of their spirits brands and, and all, all of that, because so many of these others, we have nothing for them now, mm -hmm. you know, they're just gone. So we don't have the records, you know, hopefully every now and again, someone will find something like, you know, in, in a relative's attic or something, but we don't have, you know, the brewing records. We don't have those things, um, you know, unfortunately, because those, those cost money to maintain. You have to pay people to look after them. It's a, uh, it's a big, important job and not, not enough people are doing it. So that's, that's my soapbox, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they just kept consolidating. So they would get big and then two big ones would combine and then combine and then combine and then gone. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we end up having happen. And, it, and I mean, it's great now, though, because you do see some brewing families from, you know, 150, 200 years ago coming back and saying, hey, you know, we sold our brewery then, but you know what, we want to take it back and we're going to start it all over again, like Sweet Mints. Mm -hmm. um, yep. That family had been brewing, you know, in 1600s, 1700s, 1800s for a very long time. Um, so shout out to Sweet Mints. Love Sweet Mints. Um, but yeah, that I, which I think is a really, really cool sort of continuation of, of their history. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, and it'd be great to get the Canvas lads on because, again, lots of family history of brewing there um, that maybe people aren't aware of, but great to see them, you know, getting back into it, basically. So Yeah, and and I've been digging through the, the deeds, the Dublin deeds, which, you know, cursive. 18th and 19th century cursive what's well, my favorite to read <laughs> uh, trying to 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 figure out tra trying to trace the how breweries are sold a lot of them are inherited and then you know it goes to the widow's portion which may go to her son or her daughters and then it might be sold uh there's some shady things that happen so I'm trying to kind of trace a lot of these breweries especially the women-owned ones um, is there like a website where you can upload like a cursive script and people will give you their interpretations or how uh, i mean i can i can read it like it's it's not yeah. a problem um oh god yeah so i took a paleography class however many years ago and i never thought you know <laughs> this many years out of my masters would come in handy but no i've been bad at reading cursive since the fourth grade i don't oh. write in cursive i've never written in cursive i hate it same <laughs> i'm i hear you sister yeah. i i can read it but i just don't like yeah. to there are uh, crowdsourcing projects that do that although it tends to be less about just your sort of i would say standard 19th century cursive and more about like your german frock tour things like that where it you do need a little bit more of that either paleography or sort of specialist skill with the language or the typography that that kind of thing but say it, it, those projects do exist and you can go to um uh one of my favorites that i like to give a shout is transcribe bentham where you can look at jeremy bentham's letters and help transcribe them so there are things like mm -hmm. that where you can contribute if you have free time in your day and just want to you know go on and uh you know help uh you know help people do it so that people like christina don't have to figure it out themselves it's there you can just read the transcript but <laughs> You should always go back to your primary source because sometimes people miss things, all that yeah. stuff. And and a big issue is like I think I the cursive is fine. I think it's a yeah. it's a lot of legalese as well. So I think thank you for having a contract background at some point in my <laughs> work past. Yeah. But yes, there's just lots of legalese because you know the more they wrote, the more they got paid. <laughs> yep. As the as the as the cliche is or whatever. But yes, so that's where I'm at spent however many months reading wills so yes mm -hmm. but it'll be wonderful it'll all pay off in the book go buy the book when the, when it comes out everyone so mm -hmm. yeah. Shout we'll out. absolutely we'll absolutely announce it and celebrate it once it's out in the out in the wild yes once i decide that it's done and i can actually let it go and stop being a perfectionist but i have been distracted <laughs> and i will get back to the topic and stop complaining about cursive so, all right let's go let's talk about refrigerator Ooh. but they are important well, it's a big deal yeah i actually think it's really exciting to see refrigeration and especially yeah. there they all most of them have morton's refrigerators although some of them have miller's refrigerators but we're all they're talking about these and this is also how you can kind of tell that his audience are experts because he just says steel's mechanism morton's refrigerators and he doesn't really explain it so you kind of have some idea that this 
people should know what you're talking about. But then equally in the beginning of some of his books, he does explain things a bit more. So I think maybe you read the introduction, then I guess you're supposed to have just remembered all of this. But yeah, I mean, they have these massive refrigerators that are used for cooling the wort after the boil. Um, but a lot of them are using also, you know, they have in these cooling rooms open coolers that that are just, you know, holding the wart and they have massive fans that speed up this cooling process. And it's it's all it's all really pretty cool. Um, you can like I said, you can really kind of picture this whole thing in your head with his description. And I think another thing that I want to talk about briefly is Brian. So like, you know, brine um, was used in coils and pipes to cool rooms down oh, because okay. you could get it to a cooler temperature than water. Because of the salt? Because of the salt. Interesting. So, so they would use it to keep the beer cool. Um, that so is, for, for people going to summer barbecues in the future, a top tip in your, to your bucket of ice, tip in a load of salt and it'll cool it right down. There you go. Correct. Yeah. So it, yeah, it could reduce the temperatures further and faster, they, they said. So Phoenix Brewery used brine to keep their vat houses cool. Um, and at Guinness, the air in the fermenting tun rooms were kept cooled by a temperators made from pipes where cold brine was passed through the freezing from freezing machines. And even in the hottest of scorching summer days, these pipes would be coated with ice, according to Bernard. So brine, there we go. Top and tip. I'm just... I'm going to say the hottest of scorching days in Ireland was not like the hottest scorching days in uh, South Africa or yeah, no, listen, Arizona, you know. <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch to say hot and scorching, but hot and humid, I'll go for that. Right. So we, oh, yeah. we interrupt this programming post brine and pre whatever else we're going to talk about, but we needed to go have another beer. So who's changed beers or who's changed beverages? And tell us what you got, Katie. Okay, I have changed my beverage. I am drinking a sunburnt Irish red ale from Eight Degrees Brewing. Absolutely delicious. I've actually, uh, I'm halfway through it. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Lisa, did you get another beer as I, well? I, I did indeed. I've got a Rascals uh, Hazy in Love IPA. So again, we're sticking Dublin because, you know, post Patty's Day. Uh, but also just kind of wanted to give Rascals a shout out, not just because we had a lovely time at their most recent beer release, Katie, which was lovely, new Black IPA, wonderful. But I was at one of my local pubs, the, the Cat and Cage the other week, and had just the freshest Yankee White IPA. And I've been in a good mood ever since then because it was just gorgeous to have on tap. So, so thank you for the lads at Rascals and the Cat and Cage for having lovely clean tap lines. Good job all. Good job. I like that beer, actually, the, the white IPA. And yeah. I'm also on Rascals. I've got happy days. It's still, look, it's beer number two, and it's the same beer, but I'm happy. And with my matching glass, I'm even happier. <laughs> okay, so we've cooled down our beer using brine. Christina, what other awesome inventions are we looking at here? Um, so they would then send the beer off to skimmers. So these were designed to remove yeast from the finished beer. And yeast was actually sent and sold off to distillers for their own purposes. So, and they also sold spent hops to farmers for manure. So they were reusing and reselling their products. So that this was very probably financially motivated, but I think it's really interesting. Also, maybe a hot tip for people who are brewing now, if you want to figure out things to do with some of your leftover Circular products. Circular economy, baby. Let's do it. Yeah, for, ex for sure. So let's talk about storage vats. Some of these were really massive. So let's talk about Guinnesses in particular. Um, Bernard tells us they had, uh, well, Bernard tells us that, quote, the favorite mode of astonishing visitors to the brewery is to assure them that if an army of 700,000 men were encamped around the largest vat and its contents divided among them, the soldiers would get one pint each. This is a fact. So that's what Bernard tells us. No, whether that's true or not, there who you know. knows. But, but that's what Bernard tells us. So I, I do want to move on from wonders of modern 19th century tech to kind of talking about the other people that would be employed in a brewery this big besides, you know, the brewer. 
so when I was reading through all of Bernard's tours, we're talking about, you know, men employed to clean the, the vats, um, hand scrubbing them, stables, lots of horses, um, wheelwright shops, joiners, tinsmiths, blacksmiths, plumber shops, carpenters, painters, clerks, lots of clerks doing counting, exports, all kinds of things, mail rooms, one of the important things are cooperages. And I know that like at the Guinness tour, you can see they have, they had a cooperage, but that wasn't a unique thing to Guinness. Right. A lot of these big breweries made their own casks and had massive cooperage departments. Um, the cooperage, we are told by Bernard at North Ann Street Brewery was apparently quite impressive. They had 28 coopers and they had a cask factory and their casks were actually quite famous. They went to the Manchester exhibition and exhibited their casks and theirs were apparently noted for the neatness and lightness. So cask making, big, big deal, big, big, yeah. big deal. Well, welcome mm. return of that lads. Let's, you know, let's see it, you know, casks. We're all here it. for it. So I think it's, it's very interesting that a lot of all of this was done in house. So they have their own yeah. maltings, they're roasting their own malt, they're uh, making their own casks, they're doing everything there themselves, which I think is really cool. And then, of course, they would clean the casks as well at some point in time. So they would come. So that was also uh, big, big doings uh, the cask cleaning process. So, yeah. So lots of really intricate pieces to make up these breweries and these breweries are huge like some of them are like three four acres some of them are 42 acres they're they're just taking up lots of space and lots of energy if you will, you know, yeah. with their, with their massive engines. So for example, I said 42 acres. So that's Guinness. Guinness took up 42 acres. And just to give you kind of a scale, that's the size of over 20 football fields. They had their yeah. own railway. Are we talking American football fields or like a soccer field? I don't remember which one I wrote. I don't even know the difference, <laughs> to be honest. It's big. Uh, well, let's just go with it's big. It's much of a muchness. But yeah, they had it was huge. I mean, Guinness had their own telephone service within the the place because so the head brewer could communicate with his staff. Like we're talking huge places. Did they have pneumatic that. tubes? Tell me there were pneumatic tubes because I love pneumatic tubes. But you know, <laughs> I didn't I have, see that. But I was looking for it. <laughs> my own weird thing. I know. I know. Uh, yeah. I'm with you, Lisa. Yeah. So Guinness was so big that they had their own railroad. The yeah, the with, with, within Boats. the compound within the compound that's amazing they had and their own railway they yeah they had a small fleet of boats that transferred their beer further down the liffey to the bigger boats so they had the small boats the big boats and would when like i know that so everybody in ireland knows that guinness was founded apparently 1759 which mm. is also on the cam. So. A minute to six, which is when you head for the pub, right? <laughs> That's how we all remember it. It's at we know least it all. an hour too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's a pub quiz question. It's when you head mm. to the pub, a minute to six, right? When would they have had the railroad? Not well, that early. No. No, 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 no. Guinness was not in the 1700s like the number one brewery. That, that, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. I mean, they were they were one of the bigger bigger ones, but they weren't the biggest by any stretch of the imagination. That took some time for them to to build up. Um, they weren't the biggest from the onset, I should say. Um, that they did have to kind of build their following and build their business, and that took years. I mean, as it does for for anyone. And, and they they actually had a bit of a slump sometime in the early um, years of eight, around eighteen fifteen. Um, so yeah, Guinness wasn't always number one from like the jump at all. They, they definitely took some time to build up their business as any, as I said, anyone did, but build it up. They did, you know, to be basically the biggest brewery in the world, according to some people at some point in time, um, mm -hmm. it, they just got massive, very, very, very big. 
like this could be completely wrong and please somebody correct me if I'm wrong but what I think I remember reading in Pete Brown's book was that during the time that everybody in the UK and to a certain other extent the rest of the continent um, was kind of going towards parallels and IPAs and different kinds of brews Arthur Guinness and the Guinness factory was kind of focusing and, and doubling down on porters and it seemed a strange strategy at the time um, but it paid off later now guys I could be wrong maybe I'm wrong but that's that's what I seem to remember is that um while everybody was looking left Guinness was going right and somehow that direction paid off but not immediately yeah I, I've actually just I've just turned to that page in in the book because I've got my my OG copy of it which uh, this this cover doesn't exist anymore but that is uh, young Pete Brown in the background uh, on the cover, so that's uh, good times in the back, not in the not in the foreground. But uh, he does say that though. Yeah, it says while all the English brewers were developing lighter, paler beers, Arthur was perfecting his darker, more robust extra stout porter, et cetera, et cetera. Although obviously this is a very quick overview in this section of the book. But and then he says soon the Dublin brewery was the largest in the world. So is it? Yeah, is it that? sticking with what was selling in one particular place but you know as we discussed before we know it was selling all over so maybe he mm. was just like i am going to corner this market you know yeah, well, it, yeah. And then, but other people were doing like, it as you say yeah there's also a lot to do with tax and legislation yeah, um yeah. because at first they were importing most of the porter into absolutely Ireland and it was ta favorable tax wise to kind of do that and so there's a lot of legislation in the 1700s and the 1800s of brewers coming to parliament and being like what's the story with the tax on malt you guys are all talking yeah. about how everyone's drinking whiskey and that it's a problem for you know the population because th there's a lot of talk about drinking and drunkenness and you know brewers are saying well let them drink porter yeah, Instead, yeah, you know, lower the malt cost so we can do this. And there, there's a, there's sort of like a porter versus whiskey kind of a sure thing, um, which is an oversimplification. But yeah, there, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of different sort of factors in that. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of le unfavorable legislation, and then favorable legislation, and then yeah, there's lots of ins and outs. But the brewers definitely did all kind of come all all come together to advocate for like lower taxation on malt. Um, it definitely wasn't necessarily a case of all of us, all of them, like very divided from the beginning. Right. They would come together to sort of advocate together for for what they wanted or what they they thought was yeah. fair. Well, and that's interesting too that what you were saying earlier about was it Cork where they said the water was similar to Burton because I feel like that's yeah, certainly going Cork, to Porter Brewery. Exactly. Like that's really interesting in thinking about how those compare contrast. Cause I, I think, you know, even now it's sort of a more minerally, you know, harder, harder kind of a, a beer, which I, I love, but you know, I feel like that's kind of fallen out of modern favor, but I guess that had happened, you know, cyclically then as well. But it's interesting to think about hey, yeah, how these kind of flavor trends, you know, make huge differences even then. So, well, yeah, yeah. And water is really a really important part of yeah. brewing just to, to stay on this, like Guinness. Um, I think Guinness and then a couple of others were brewing with water out of the Grand Canal in Dublin. And this was a really important part because they wanted that water. Like it, they used well water for refrigeration, but they used water from the Grand Canal for their brewing because it had the quality within it that they wanted. And it was a couple of different porter breweries that did this in particular. So the and water is something that Bernard spends a lot of time talking about, to be honest, a lot of time. Just on about. just on water. Sorry to uh, cut you there, but just on water, we we have an episode coming up actually on water. So stay tuned. It might be the following week. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know when this one is launching, but it'll probably be next week this time. So stay tuned. Lovely episode on water coming up. Yes, hugely. Important. Yeah. And, and also to, to mention that there were specific water companies in Ireland that made water. So there was Cork Waterworks, um, which supplied water to brew porter. Uh, their, their water was apparently famous for both brewing and distilling. Uh, Mountjoy Brewery used water from the Dublin Canal to brew their beer. Um, that makes sense. They, it's right there. Yeah, all good. They also use, they also bought, like, they also brought in different kinds of water for different things. 
um, for cleaning and whatnot. North oh, Antry Brewery used water from the Grand Canal for brewing and for cooling and malting. The water came from a deep well. For cast cleaning and fire departments, they used Vardy water or town water. Um, let me see. Ladies Well Brewery had three wells in their premises, which were used to supply cold water for temperating purposes. And the brewing water actually came from the town. So, again, they used the specific water because it worked well with what they wanted. So, yeah, water was really a very important part. And that's a brief summary. I mean, he talked about oh, yeah. water a lot mm. for each of them. And they all had very in-depth like, explanations for why they used the water that they used and the point of it. So water is a really important part. And the other thing that I want to stress is water is not just an important part of brewing um the beer itself but it would not have been possible to run the steam engines it would not have yeah. been possible to run the cooling units that brian we we're talking about it needs water so in this industrial brewing water is so important um cleaning the casks there's a fire hazard issue so a lot of these bernard spends a lot of time talking about the fire safety apparatuses and all of these and the water tanks or whatever they have for those purposes. So water is really, really important in these breweries in so many different ways, which I found really fascinating when I was researching it because I just didn't think of it. Like, obviously, now that you hear it, you're like, oh, yeah, of course. But mm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the horses, again, I have a whole hobby horse. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. On different brewery horses and Guinness is one I need to do more research into because it looks like they had a lot of different horses for different, you know, different activities. But, you know, like Carlsberg had, you know, they settled on Jutland horses and, you know, obviously you have Anheuser-Busch and their Clydesdales, but there's a, there's a lot there. It's, you know, that's just you, what we still Lisa, see Lisa, you say obviously as if this is general obviously. knowledge. <laughs> like, I didn't even know that breweries used horses. I'm clearly oh, dumb. We could, we oh, could do yeah. a whole, we could do a whole, maybe not an entire episode, but maybe we'll do like a, a quick hits episode at some point and talk about brewery horses and dray horses because there's a whole thing there. It's, it's I'm keen. So it, it's so important and I'm not going to go in, into depth of this, but there's a whole instance in like, I think it's the late 1600s in Dublin where the military was stealing horses off of brewers and a Duke Ooh. stepped in and said, no. And that's how we know how many breweries were in Dublin because of their allotment of horses, because he said, you can have this many horses, you can have this many horses and you can have this many horses. You're the kidding horses, me. The horses were so important to the brewing so they could sell their ale and selling their ale gave the excise man the money so his majesty wanted to make sure he was getting that sweet sweet cash so he may stepped in they had the duke step in to make sure that all the breweries weren't having their horses stolen that's fascinating i yeah. my brain is exploded i need wow. to know more about this we need an episode on this okay we'll, we'll make a note we'll make a note horses yeah. Hors of beer oh. and it's not just about christmas ads okay <laughs> no it's really they're really really important very important part of yeah. the trade actually um and i guess i will kind of end um on another kind of interesting fun fact if you mm -hmm. don't know this um bellevue and rialto in dublin started out as villages that were created by guinness um for their workers and that's a whole big episode. There's a lot to unpack there. Yes. So if you yeah, didn't Guinness know that. did a lot for its employees. And I, I, I don't mean in the charitable kind way, but I mean, there, there was a lot because the, the, the industry needed to run so well. You know, there was things like, I guess, child care, health care, everything was kind of built in and fairly advanced, I guess, for what we consider now. But um, yeah, that would be a great episode, actually. Yeah, it would be. So in Bellevue, there were 70 houses that they made um, with sort of different setups. 50 were single sets and in double sets. Um, and then in Rialto was prim primarily like two massive buildings of flats, uh, three stories high, we're told, um, with, again, different sets of rooms. Um, these could be rented out, of course. And then there are a few like detached cottages for people sort of like higher up on the rungs. But I think that's kind of pretty cool. And all of these villages apparently had a dispensary, um, a medical attendant, 
that would come around and check things out. There was a recreation ground, there were cooperative stores, there were all kinds of clubs for men. And the company also provided for widows upon the death of their husband. So they did try to, to treat their workers pretty well. Mm. Um, well, to some extent, right? So, cause not everyone was particularly happy about their employment there or whatever, but that's a thing for another day, but you know, there was some efforts there to, to, especially caring for, you know, the widows and death, their husbands, like they, there are some efforts there to take care of your employees for sure. I mean, by today's standards, Guinness back then probably does better than a lot of companies today. Precisely. Um, when yeah. you think about the big corporations and like the workers who couldn't even get a break to sit down or go to the bathroom, like they're probably definitely some better working conditions back then and some and some not and some not. Hmm. Uh, yeah, but fair. Guys, are there any other questions, any other tidbits that we need to share? Otherwise, we're gonna wrap this up because we are already we're already way over time now. <laughs> yeah, we just know we're gonna come back to the horses. That it, we'll get there. We'll get there. There we go. We're coming back to horses. We're coming back to Guinness and its way of working. Water, and, water. And We've now. got a lot coming up. Water's coming up. It's already it's already in the bag. So listen out for water. And for anybody else, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for always sharing and liking and subscribing and doing all the good stuff. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're everywhere. Beer Ladies Pod, Beer Ladies Podcast, where it's not pod. And buy us a beer if you'd like. That would be fun. We're at beer, uh, buy me a coffee forward slash Beer Ladies Podcast. But yeah, friends, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your questions and your weird mysteries of <laughs> brewing in the industrial uh, revolution. <laughs> it's been It's been truly illuminating. Right, see you next week, everybody. And I hope that your Paddy's Day hangover really isn't that bad. Bye-bye-bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.